talking blues Climb the fence, books and pens I can tell that we are gonna be friends Okay, we stay in the United States. From the Boston Globe, we have Derek Jackson. Yeah? American media stereotypes. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. Um, I know the uh, five o'clock is the, uh, the bewitching hour. People are getting hungry. People are tired. People are exhausted. Um, so I'll do my best to try to keep you awake uh, till uh, to the end of the day, um, however depressing some of my stuff might be. So um, I, I want to say uh, uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, Germany, had in a, in a re almost ridiculous way, has become very special in my life. Um, my, both my sons, uh, 26 and 21, uh, both speak fluent German for completely separate reasons. The oldest needed to get a, a C in German in his uh, community college class to qualify for a culinary arts internship in the Swiss Alps. He got a C. The youngest, um, we felt he was uh, immature, immature after high school to uh, invest in his college education. <laughs> so we said, son, you need a gap year. And uh, it turned out that uh, he had had, our boys had had um, um, au pairs there in their early lives. And um, his au pair, when he was three years old, was a woman from Germany. Turns out that in time for his gap year, she was coming off her third child on, oh, I can't stand this, her third one-year paid maternity leave with a guaranteed job when she went back. Anybody in the United States, anybody here from the United States knows exactly what I'm talking about when I'm in pain when I say that. <laughs> um, so he came, uh, had a nice gap year, grew up uh, quite a bit, and just uh, came back here. He just left here. He had a junior semester this fall in Heidelberg at a uni inter international university in Heidelberg. So um, I'm rapidly becoming indebted to Germany for the salvation of my sons. So, the great thing about uh, being in newspapers for four decades, from a 16-year-old reporter and photographer for an African-American weekly in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to being a 56-year-old columnist and editorial board writer at the Boston Globe, is that, of course, the story you think you're going to write is so often not the one you end up writing. I thought when Mark invited me to speak, I thought a few weeks ago I would speak in a very straightforward manner very, you know, professional, about whether the American media has matured around racial stereotypes at a time that we have the first African-American president. That alone would have been, I think, rich exploration along the lines desired of a conference on media censorship and freedom, uh, because to me, stereotypes are a major form of censorship, denying the victimized a very serious piece of their freedom. But news changes things. Now, I don't know how many of you are fans of the National Basketball Association, our premier professional league, but we have received an undeniable answer in these last three weeks in the United States how we have much more maturing to do. For those of you who are nodding your heads, you know that I'm about to talk about a six foot three guard for the New York Knicks, who is short, well, six, three, six foot three in pro basketball is short, almost short, an Asian American, graduate of Harvard, cut from two prior teams, and riding the bench, thrust into a starting role, and over the last three weeks, marched the Knicks to a winning streak that has become a global hoops phenomenon, scoring as many as 38 points in one game, passing for 14 assists in another, and hitting a long shot at the buzzer for one victory that reverberated all over the world on YouTube. It should have been a great story, simply of an undersized underdog rising out of nowhere. But a barrage of Asian stereotypes evoking men as less than manly, hearkening back to when Chinese immigrants were viewed as inferior laborers, and betraying food as the only reference point for many Americans, raised their ugly head. A prominent sports television commentator made a crude reference to the size of Lynn's lower anatomy. An ESPN anchor, an ESPN online editor, and a Knicks 
radio play-by-play -play broadcaster all use the phrase chink in the armor. Madison Square Garden Network, the home station of the Knicks, showed a poster of Lynn coming out of a fortune cookie and a well-known ice cream maker in America, Ben and Jerry's, tried to launch a new flavor, or a branch of theirs, tried to launch a new flavor of frozen yogurt with bits of fortune cookies. And the New York Post simply said it all with a headline, Amazing. In a story reacting to all this in the Los Angeles Times, University of Colorado professor of Asian American Studies, Daryl Maeda said, in this country, Asian Americans are stereotyped as the meek and the mild, the ones who will always take the racism. There is a perception that it's okay to offend Asian Americans because they simply won't fight back. The one thing I think is interesting about this whole Jeremy Lin sanity is that it has forced us to think about how we think about race in general. Asian Americans, and this is still Maeda talking, Asian Americans have long been put into this safe little slot and Jeremy has taken us out of it. This all shows how Asian Americans have long been the invisible minority. There were so many miscues, in fact, that some of them were committed by black journalists, of all people. There were so many miscues that the uh, um, Association of Asian American Journalists put out a an advice guide to, the, to radio and television and newspapers warning against use of Chinese food to refer to Lin, <laughs> referring to the shape of his eyes, and definitely avoid the use of the color yellow. A more subtle thing, but related thing, happened when Tiger Woods burst onto the scene when he won his first master's title 15 years ago. African Americans, of course, have never been the invisible minority the way Asian Americans, with our terrible history of slavery, segregation, and continuing disparities. But almost precisely because of that history, the media's celebratory reaction to Woods was way beyond reality. Woods became, in my view, the latest comic strip in America's never-ending search for a black Superman. After his victory in the Masters, a New York Times headline said Woods tears down barriers. The Atlanta Constitution, Journal of Constitution said he breaks down the color barrier. The Austin Statesman, American Statesman said Tiger shatters records, barriers. The Baltimore Sun called it a day of broken barriers. The Los Angeles Times said barriers are buried. In the comics, Metropolis hails a man who bursts through the wall to save us. In this case, it was it's a nine iron. It's a Nike swoosh. It's Tiger. The Kansas City Star went so far as to call Woods a hero for our day. And the Philadelphia Inquirer said, he won for us all. When's the last time a golfer has won for you? <laughs> the irony in this coverage was that countless newspaper and television stories noted that Woods' victory came just two days before the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's entry into white baseball. There was a stunning denial embedded into that coverage. Most of the comparisons between Wood and Robinson were done with a perfectly straight face in prose instead of a sickened shame that we've gone 50 years and we are still cheering token successes, particularly in a sport where Woods is likely to remain a token for quite some time. A significant part of the problem that the media made so many mistakes for a pioneering Asian American basketball player and an American, African American golfer, who for the record, of course, is also of Asian and European descent, is that the presence of people of color in the newsrooms of America has risen only marginally above token status. It is important to remember that what, what black presence there is in mainstream newsrooms is hugely due to the 1968 Kerner Commission report on the alienation of African Americans behind the riots of the late 1960s, which is now officially a half century ago. The commission devoted one of its first memorable sections, one of its most memorable sections, to the media, saying, 
quote, the journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out, hiring, training, and promoting Negroes. Fewer than 5% of the people employed by the news business and editorial jobs in the United States today are Negroes. We urge the news media to do everything possible to train and promote their Negro reporters to positions where those who are qualified can contribute and have an effect on policy decisions. I myself was hired by the Milwaukee Journal during college just four years after the publication of the Kerner Commission report. I realized after listening to Marta, uh, you still, you're still here, uh, li listen to Marta that I actually got my start in a world somewhere in between mainstream journalism and the citizen journalism she was talking about because the foundation of most black newspapers in the United States was a protest vehicle ag against the coverage they were not getting in the mainstream press. To be sure now there has been significant progress with African-American journalists, individual African-American journalists and journalists of, of many colors providing critical perspective and illumination of some of the biggest stories um, from globally from the famines in Africa to the end of apartheid in South Africa to of course the more recent tragedies in Haiti to the dramatic disparities in my country um, and of course the election of Barack Obama as president. But I believe those advances in perspective and the ability of the media to stay in touch with populations that have been left behind by progress, especially when you add the digital divide, which has already been spoken about this afternoon, to old-fashioned disparities in education and housing, those advances in journalism are under serious threat. The United States is now so multicultural that 36% of the population is of color with most projections showing America to be majority color by, by mid-century. But the percentage of people of color in newsrooms, after rising from 3.95% in 1978, rose to a high of 13.73% in 2006, but has now slipped back to under 13%. That means mathematically, in this day, are still only one-third as represented as they should be in America's newspaper newsrooms. Milton Coleman, who had one of the longest runs of an African American at the top of the journalism world at, as, a, it, at, as, as, as an editor at the Washington Post and president of the American Associ Society of Newspaper Editors recently wrote, quote, newsrooms are going in the opposite direction. This is an accuracy and credibility issue for our newsrooms. The credibility is even more acute for African Americans who make up 13% of the American population. The, the percentage of us in the newsroom, despite the current commission report, has never risen higher than 5.5% and today is back under 5%. And those were the very statistics cited so harshly in 1968 by the Kerner Commission. You could still argue and I actually argue, America has still gotten a good bank for even this halting commitment to diversity. Stereotypes have improved in some areas, particularly with regard to African Americans. One area that I was particularly engaged in in the late 1980s and 1990s was sports stereotypes. At that time, sports broadcasting was deeply mired, almost hopelessly mired, in explaining the accomplishments of black athletes through purely physical attributes while describing the play of white athletes as almost purely intellectual. In one survey, after many hours of tapes, you gotta be a real sports fan to watch this much tape. I found that even though black players made up the majority of rosters and white players received the decisive majority of comments, um, white players, despite being, a, let me put it another way, white players, despite being a minority of the players, received the vast majority of comments that I call brains. And black players got the vast majority of comments for what I call brawn. And in a category I call dunce, which is when players are cited for doing stupid things, mindless things, black athletes in pro football received 90% of dunce comments. And in college basketball, they received 82% of dunce comments. As a result of the scrutiny of the words, not just by me, but other 
fellow uh, black journalists, things did get better in broadcasting. By the time, by the 1990s, when the Black Williams sisters exploded onto the tennis world, they, yes, they were uh, annoyingly uh, talked about for their power and strength and their f uh, physical looks, but they also received a reassuring amount of accolades for their smarts on the court as well. But sports is a, as tough as it was, it's a much easier touchstone than the non-sports world. I guess most of you here would call it the real world. For example, stereotypes have reared their head in the last two American presidential campaigns, the 2008 and the one right now. In the 2008 primaries, Hillary Clinton had to apologize to Barack Obama after Clinton's campaign tried to make an issue of Obama's teenage drug use in a nation where African Americans just happen to be disproportionately imprisoned for drugs, even though Americans use illegal drugs at close to their racial percentages. More perniciously, Clinton's strategist advised her in a memo that was later leaked, but she did not act on it, that the best way to defeat Obama would be to convince voters that he is, quote, not fundamentally American in his thinking and in his values. Now, Hillary Clinton did not aim that low, but the Republicans did, with vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin saying in the last month of the election, I am so fearful that this is not a man who sees America the way you and I see America. Such comments speak to a multitude of stereotypes, not just about African Americans being full citizens, but Latinos, Asians, and that persistent campaign that still is going on today to somehow declare that Obama is a Muslim, which of course, if he was a Muslim, somehow I guess that would disqualify him from the presidency, right? Of course, now Obama did win, and that does speak volumes that a growing percentage of Americans do see past stereotypes, even though Obama, in the worst economy in modern times and fatigue over two wars, still lost the popular vote by 12 percentage points to John McCain. It's a popular white vote by 12 percentage points to John McCain. The reality is Obama won just because, because just enough white voters in many key states, you all know that we don't really elect nationally, we elect state by state, and the, we call it the Electoral College. So it's very key to win state by state by state. And I'm happy to say he won uh, Wisconsin, my home state. So mm -hmm. and it, it, he, he, Wisconsin was one of the few states that he uh, actually did get the majority white vote. But stereotypes have been well at work in our current election from all the Republican candidates. And I actually don't say this as a partisan, I say it because it's a fact. Newt Gingrich and Ritz Santorum bit themselves in Iowa and New Hampshire with stereotyped associations of African Americans with food stamps, while Ron Paul was embarrassed by his 1992 newsletter that said the Los Angeles riots over the Rodney King police beating verdict ended only when, quote, it came time for the blacks to pick up their welfare checks. All of that ignored the fact that our share of food assistance to the white poor and the unemployed during this recession, these last four years, the highest group of rise is among white Americans. The state with the highest participation in what we call this, we have another longer name for what we call food stamps now, but the state with the highest participation now is Oregon, where 74% of the recipients were white. Among the states with the largest one-year increases was Idaho, where 81% of recipients were white. Yet, in South Carolina, Newt Gingrich received a standing ovation for calling Barack Obama the food stamp president, and Mitt Romney was applauded for saying Obama is turning America into a, quote, entitlement society. Moreover, Romney, like Sarah Palin, 
said he was, quote, frightened that we have a president that doesn't understand America. In a line that I'm sure will resonate with many of you in this room, Romney says Obama wants to, quote, transform us into a European-style welfare state instead of relying on hard work. He wants to take money from someone and give it to others. If you're looking for someone who will create more and more benefits and promise more and more free stuff to you, that's not me. You've already got that president. So why does there remain such currency and stereotypes in the year 2012? Even with a black president, or in these latter cases, maybe perhaps precisely because we have a black president. Why is it that our political discourse in modern America is still infected with suggestions that black people, and Latinos in particular, remain lazy, drug-taking, criminalistic, unworthy people who fall short of full citizenship? The media bears significant responsibility for these lingering attitudes that sometimes erupt in our border politics with Mexico and our continuing domestic and military miscues with Muslims and even an Asian American basketball player. In the mid-1990s, Yale professor Martin Gillens conducted studies that found that even though African Americans are 29% of the poor, 65% of the poor people on television were African Americans, and African Americans were also 62% of the poor portrayed in Newsweek, Time, and US News and World Report. The stereotype that black people have no work ethic was strongly reinforced by the fact that the black working poor were far less likely to be depicted in news stories than the non-working poor. Another survey found that when a white person was the subject of a story on unemployment, 71% of white viewers said unemployment was one of the nation's top three problems. But when the story was about a jobless African American, the percentage of people who thought it was one of the top three problems dropped to 53%. In yet one more study, even though women make up the vast majority of Americans on welfare, 71% of the people sources in stories on cutting welfare benefits were men. Meanwhile, in a 1998 look at the database of my own newspaper, the phrase welfare reform appeared 14 times more often than the phrase corporate welfare. To add to that, the Berkeley Media Studies Group found that in a look at 26 California television stations, that youth were overwhelmingly portrayed in violent roles to the point where only 6% of all stories about youth featured youth accomplishments. Quote, the study concluded that a youth had to perform an extraordinary feat, fly solo across the country to appear on local television news in positive circumstances. Just yesterday, we had another terrible school shooting in the United States. It will be interesting to see how the alleged assailant and his community is depicted. It was in Ohio. In the past, Stereotypes have led to the extremely different depictions of suburban and small city school shooters compared with young boys in African American and Latino inner cities. While many a lead on black and brown kids speculates on whether a violent act was gang related or drug related, much of the coverage, I would say most of the coverage, of white school shooters, going back to Columbine and other places, Arkansas and Mississippi, involves significant elements of surprise and shock that a particular youth could have ever done such a thing, and emotional and physical descriptions of those kids drew an image of prior innocence. I suspect that such stereotypes have long-ranging effects, reaching down into how much we care, or more correctly, how much we don't care, about funding public education and barely attacking our achievement gaps. In fact, it is rarely discussed in debates on stereotypes just how much innocence is granted, usually to white Americans. When I used to teach journalism at a Boston college, one of my first exercises was to, to help them understand the power of the media was to ask them to tell me, 
What percentage of illegal drugs are presumed by what racial group? My students would all, my students would never guess anywhere close to the percentage of the racial population, which is what the CDC says is what the consumption is. Instead, my students guessed 50, 60, 80 percent of illegal drugs were consumed by black kids. That issue of innocence may lead the media to underplay aspects of major news stories that could educate us all. For instance, the media coverage of both the horrific Columbine school shootings and the Oklahoma City bombing were marked by how the school shooters and Timothy McVeigh trafficked in the most vile of racist or skinhead literature. Few stories brought such trafficking into the front and center of the development, the development and the social development of those killers whose victims were of many ethnicities. Similarly, right-wing violence, when we have it, is rarely called Christian terrorism, not certainly as liberally as we label Muslim terrorism. So what is the state today? A 2010 study by researchers at Auburn University and the University of South Carolina said, an interesting study, uh, uh, this is about uh, welfare. An interesting finding of this study is that the most frequently mentioned causal attribution was broken family with teen pregnancy or being promiscuous cast as the major cause of poverty. This is not a new finding. Previous studies have report, reported that the media portray the poor not only as lazy, but also as sexually irresponsible. Frequently linking poverty to irresponsible sexual behavior is problematic for several reasons. To sum it up, most meaning the number one is that the fault is always with the person on the street and not with any societal structure. Coverage of the poor remains episodic, centering around disasters like Hurricane Katrina or the Haiti earthquake. One study said episodic framing of the issues or focusing on personal stories rather than social backgrounds is a kind of professional routine for the American news media. Television in particular, quote, does not cover the issues. It tells stories. It is in this process of telling stories that television diverts attention from systemic and institutional responsibilities. In a 2010 study of health care coverage disparities, by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, they found that while there was c some coverage of disparities, nearly 70% of articles never provided a, a, a single causal, a, a cause for why this problem was here, or solution, or explanations. If we are to move beyond individual solutions to re eliminate racial, ethnic health disparities, more research is needed to better understand how the public interprets these competing explanations and how we can divide, design, design effective messages to raise awareness about the social determinants of health. That's just two years ago from the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll read one more and I'll skip a couple others. A 2009 Washington State study found that participants exposed to television clips reinforcing the Asian American model minority stereotype were more likely to positively evaluate Asian Americans and to negatively evaluate African Americans. So they found that one stereotype is a double whammy. If you look at one group of color positively, you also are at risk at looking at another group negatively at the same time. And finally, even though most measures of crime have fallen since the 1970s, the incarceration of Americans for nonviolent offenses, most notably nonviolent drug possession, shot to heights unknown in the rest of the, the, of the developed world. Many researchers say media focus on crime has helped fuel this imbalance. A College of William and Mary Law Review article found that crime remains the leading type of news story for both local and television networks. The article also concluded that crime reporting in a shrinking era for newspapers 
remains, quote, a staple that is increasingly presented in a more tabloid style. And the association of crime with black people and the association of that in national politics was found to be strikingly strong in an unusual way in the 1996 presidential campaign. The William and Mary article cited a striking experiment that found that President Clinton, a Democrat, had a large lead in the polls over Republican challenger Bob Dole with television viewers who were shown newscasts that had no crime in them. But when crime was shown before a clip of Clinton, his popularity among the experimental viewers dropped by 25%. And most of you who know about our politics know that in presidential elections, black people give about 90% of their vote to the Democratic Party. None of this is a surprise when studies have shown everything from more black people shown in handcuffs for the same crime than white assailants. This was in, in, in Chicago television. None of this is a, a surprise when a University of Illinois study found that uh, heavy television users were more likely to assume a black uh, suspect was more guilty. And so one could easily come away with that with a feeling of despair. I could have made you even more depressed but I just skipped two pages. I would like though to think that all of us in this room are here because the media and journalism, journalism certainly for me, is, it born, is an optimistic enterprise. Born of the notion that if you do the right story, get out the right set of facts, put the proper face on an issue, that you, we, can all be an agent of change. Despite the litany of studies that shows how journalism in America remains severely challenged to tell the whole story about whole groups of people, we are still living in a special moment. How could it be, with all of this that I just cited, that Barack Obama could be in the White House. I would posit that America, a nation that for reasons not all positive, particularly thrives on the mythology of the exceptional individual who by accident or by very careful packaging fits no stereotypes like a Tiger Woods or a Colin Powell or now a Jeremy Lin. America got a long enough look at Obama during nearly two year, a nearly two-year presidential campaign for voters to make up their own minds based on his promises and prescriptions for domestic and foreign policy in a troubled land. While there were some early newspa newspaper and magazine articles on Obama's biracial identity, some of it became fairly hilarious, like, is he black enough? The campaign was remarkable for the relative lack of stereotyping, in my view. So fair coverage of an individual is po has become possible in the United States, and that's a good thing. But the challenges grow to talk about groups of people in this fair manner, especially now as our level of multiculturalism continues to expand. Recently, a leading home improvement chain and a prominent web travel booking site pulled ads from a reality television show featuring the lives of American Muslims. While Jeremy Lin is breaking stereotypes in sports, the New York Times recently re reported that Asians and Latinos are still virtually invisible on the theater stage, cast in only 2 and 4% of roles in Broadway from 2006 to 2011. While listening to Marta this afternoon, I wondered how maybe citizen journalism would play on this issue. Could people underrepresented in mainstream newspaper and television start a Twitter uprising against stereotypes? Or is it, or can that, can that compete or overcome what Jerry referred to as the gated community of media, which gives me my paycheck. <laughs> But I am not necessarily neither optimistic or pessimistic about technology because um, we've had various technology developments in the last century and we still have major, major 
mess ups. A couple weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal had a full page ad by J. Crew, famous uh, clothes company, that had six men characterized, five white men, and one black man. All five white men were looking directly into the camera. The black man was looking off to the side. You could barely discern his face. What was the message in there? We're still afraid to look at a black face? You would think that that would not be the overt answer, but I showed it to many friends, and for those of us of color, it hits you like a ton of bricks. And in closing, because of those uncertainties about technology, even though as we marvel at how, they were, how it played a role in Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street, the mainstream media must continue to ask, through its own self-analysis and through its own self-reporting, how to make everyone visible with all of their wonder and warts in proportion. During the 2008 presidential campaign, I was in a car with Obama and I asked him if he was bothered by the attempts by the Clinton camp to label him a druggie. His answer to me was, quote, I won't speak to the racial element of it because I think, you know, if I were a white candidate, obviously somebody suggesting falsely that they were a drug dealer, it's never good. But in sum, Obama, who has written about his teenage drug use in his own memoir, said, quote, there's been a series of these kinds of tactics that at some point we've just got to send a clear signal this is not what we're about. Unquote. That could be the theme for us in journalism in America. And I suspect, from what little I've seen about some incidents of soccer players in Europe uh, uh, who are a dark skin, uh, it's not just an American issue. Journalism has to send a clear signal of what the mass of people of color, and not just the first president of color, are about. It has to start within the newsrooms of America, which by the definition of having newsrooms, where the representation of people of color is only one-third percent of their population, is still living out what the Kerner Commission said, quote, the media report and write from a standpoint of a white man's world. We believe that to live up to their own professed standards, the media simply must exercise a higher degree of care and a greater level of sophistication than they have shown in this area, higher, perhaps, than the, order, the level ordinarily acceptable with other stories. If we met that challenge, we would produce a media where the, that higher degree of care would surely lead to a much greater level of sophistication in society and honestly addressing all the disparities that remain. Thank you. Um, okay, so very briefly, um, you mentioned one study that showed the influence of uh, visual media on developing stereotypes. And uh, as I was doing a bit of research on the subject, mostly American articles, I found that this may have been the biggest source of stereotypes, possibly. Maybe not, not politics, and if, would you agree on that? And if yes, uh, can it be changed by journalism, or should it be changed in some other way? You're saying, is television the biggest source of stereotypes? Television and, well, visual media. Well, is, uh, just, just common sense would say it would be because most, peop most Americans get their news by either network television or cable, cable news. So, um, it, it, um, and television, <laughs> I mean, local networks to this day, the number one thing, the number one type of news that leads local news is crime. And uh, that puts uh, black people, and uh, depending on the city, Latinos at risk at being overly depicted in negative ways. Uh, I also meant not just uh, news media, but also and shows, programs, where, with depictions of races in a stereotypical way. Uh, that 
even cartoons for little kids that seem to me to have more influence than actual news journals and so on. Would you agree on that? Uh, there, I didn't quote them because I had to skip over what I already had for just the media. Um, no, there have, been there have been studies from everything from cartoons to even toy boxes. Um, the, the lack of, uh, I remember 20 years ago, um, even though every kid plays with toys, uh, uh, people of color were completely absent on, the to on toy box covers. So, um, yeah, it comes at a, a million different ways. Um, and I think, but a toy company is not going to solve the stereotype problem by itself. A cartoon company is going to, Disney still hasn't had a black male lead in their cartoon productions. So uh, it's incumbent on us in the media. It's really our responsibility in the media to get it right. Thank you. Some other questions? Maybe we can have a break now. Ten minutes. I can 